Good morning and welcome in the name of Jesus Christ to McCownville United Methodist Church. As United Methodist Christians, we are called to make disciples for Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. A few morning announcements this morning. If you remember, the Albany Crop Walk was a little bit different this year as we walked alone but together. They reported yesterday that they have raised a total of $86,300 as regional contributions for this year. Their goal this year was 90,000, and the organizers have been very pleased with participation. If you would still like to contribute, but have not yet done so, mail your check to the Capital Area Council of Churches, or go onto the Albany Crop Walk website and search for McCownville Church. Next Sunday, we are going to start our traditional summer worship hours. So rather than meeting as we have for many months now at 9.30 for Facebook Live broadcasts, we will begin our broadcasts at 10 a.m. Gives you a little extra time to sleep in during these summer hours. Don't forget, this Tuesday is our annual church char charge conference at 7 p.m. by Zoom meeting. Ballots to vote for trustees seeking re-election and ratifying our new report conference have been sent out. If you have not already received your contact information to access the Zoom meeting um, and would like to do so, please contact the church office during office hours Monday or Tuesday. We are hosting a virtual chicken barbecue fundraiser through Facebook. If you would like to participate in our uh, annual Brooks, or biannual, I should say, um, Brooks Barbecue, then please uh, go to our church website, click on the Make a Donation page, and make a contribution online, or mail in a check to the church office with virtual chicken barbecue in the memo line. There are instructions on Facebook for those of you who are on Facebook, or you can contact the church office. I believe an email has also gone out with instructions. There's new content online for Sunday school. If you have children of Sunday school age, and um, uh, uh, activities to go along with those stories are available for free in the office waiting area. Please come during visiting or office hours in order to get these materials. That's all I have for announcements this morning. So please join me in the opening song, Blessed Assurance. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of His Spirit, what This is my story, this is my song. Raising my sin. Savior all the day. 
And now please join me in the opening prayer. Lord of healing and mercy, remind us again of your power to heal our lives from fears and mistrust. Open our hearts to believe in your restorative power and your great compassion for us. Give us healing and make us agents of peace for you in this year. Amen. And the prayer of confession. Merciful Lord, we are so fearful these days. We encounter economic situations which threaten to destroy our lives. We encounter anger, fear, and hostility, and we feel as though we are about to drown. We want to place our trust in you, but so many times before, when we have trusted others, we have been let down. Help us to truly trust your mercy and love. Heal and forgive our fears and sins. Open our hearts to receive your mercy and help us to become your disciples. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hear these words of assurance. Feel the touch of Christ on your heart. You are healed and forgiven. Rejoice. God is with you now and always. Amen. This is the time in the service when we um, come to you to ask for renewal of your offerings. We appreciate the generous giving that you have already uh, supported McCownville and its ministries. Please mail your offerings into the church or give online at the website shown above. We thank you always for your continuous support of our ministries, even as we worship in this way together. Today is Confirmation Sunday. And as we approach the um, end of our school year and wrap up the calendar, which we're used to, then we um, would have celebrated confirmation in uh, the park by asking our confirmation students to um, make take vows of membership. Students preparing for confirmation participate in a study of the United Methodist history and its doctrine, learning what we practice as a church and what makes us uniquely Methodists. The study was unique and different in a couple of ways. We taught the class with new curriculum. We've been using the old curriculum for 20 years or so, and this year decided to adopt new curriculum into our program. And we taught it largely through Zoom meetings, seeing each other only virtually during our weekly one-hour online classes. Each of the students in the study has participated faithfully, and I am grateful for that but there were elements lost by not having active participation in person, in class, or with our mentors. We were not able to have the supplemental experiences in the sacrament, like observing a baptism together, or discussion of communication, I'm sorry, our discussion of communion included a modified communion activity. 
and our mentors were not able to take their students to participate in a worship service of another tradition. We have also been unable to participate in collaborative service projects or host a retreat. But what we have been able to do is week for, meet for weekly 15 weeks their students regarding their studies and their questions. I know that this has been a struggle um, with our local restrictions currently in place. We invited two youth missionaries to talk to us about what the United Methodist Church is like in countries like Nicaragua and the Philippines. Methodist Church Parents, students, and mentors have been encouraged to look for online worship services from a different denomination. We are all worshiping online in today's quarantine world and looking for a worship service that you can experience outside the United Methodist Church. And talking about the differences and similarities helps us understand what it means to be a Methodist. The great thing is now the world is open to us. We can look online for a church anywhere in the United States or the world of any denomination with just a few keystrokes. Our plan is to celebrate the students in September at a Tawasentha Park picnic as was previously planned for today. We will have a celebration and what a celebration it will be. We will all be back together and celebrating the confirmation of members for these students. But for now, help me honor these students who have been working so hard. Pray for their continued faith journey and continue to support them as we navigate through these times together. The students that I will be presenting for membership through confirmation are. Emily Bell, Graham Clark, Michaela Keene, Dawn Matthews, Riley Mahari, Rowan Spencer, and Jackson Wells. Please keep these students. Thank you. Thank you, Angela, and congratulations. I look forward to confirming these students in the in the fall. And I'm proud of each and every one of you. Thank you, and thank you to the mentors. And it is good to be together again, folks. I pray that God has been with you and guided you throughout the week and given you the, the comfort and the peace that you need through these times that seem to uh, change daily, hourly sometimes, it seems like. Um, but uh, we come together and we pray together and lift up the prayers of our hearts for one another. And I ask you, if you have any prayers that you can, and are on Facebook, you can put them in the comments section right now as we pray or during the week, and we will be checking and lift them up in prayer, and then vocally speak of those folks next week. Um, my sister Kim is still dealing with some AFib problems, and if anyone has experienced that, I'm sure you know the anxiety and the other feelings that come along with that. Um, James raised his hand. He has been there and experienced it. So, Kim, we are praying for you, for God to give you peace and healing and direct you to the right doctors and nurses. And God is already bringing friends and, and those near her, around her, to comfort her and give her clarity. Um, and um, Norm... We haven't got an update, and I have not been able to get an update on Norman, but uh, he did fall and um, broke his foot in three places. And so, you know, Norman, we are praying for you and for Ellen, and uh, pray for that healing. Um, friend of Angela, Elizabeth's mother, whose cancer is back, and... Uh, the prognosis is not looking good for her, so we lift up um, Elizabeth's mother and uh, 
pray God, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers for all of these that we have spoken. And we'll take a few moments together now, and let's join our hearts and our minds and just uh, have a few moments of silent prayer together. Gracious God, we do thank you that we can come before you and while we may be in our own homes and distanced this morning, our hearts and our minds are centered and together as one. Hear the prayers of our hearts for each and every individual, wherever they are today that is being lifted up, O oh God, and whatever it is the need, we know, Lord, that you are able able to, to provide and to care for us and for them. Speak your words of peace and healing into our lives. Help us to trust you, Lord. And, and we pray for all who are suffering or struggling in body, mind, or spirit. We pray for those who feel less than or have been treated less than. We deal for equality and not separation by race or gender or any other thing, Lord, that we could come together and be one people, your people, centered on love and respect and compassion for one another. Pray for all those who are still ill or have become ill from the COVID-19 and uh, for the doctors and nurses and caregivers on the front lines and first responders. And we just thank you for those folks, for those people, oh God. We pray that as we consider opening the building again to invite your church back into it, uh, that you will lead us and guide us and give us wisdom and protection and watch over and help us to make right choices so that everyone can gather at the right time and gather safely, Lord, because care for one another is what we want to be about. So we thank you. We. Uh, we are grateful that in the midst of it all, you are continually with us and remain with us. So we thank you again and thank you for hearing our prayers, O God, and we pray together now as Jesus taught us saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. not into temptation but deliver us from evil for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen
And now please join me for the scripture reading this morning, which comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 1 through 16. <clears throat> now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you falsely, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading, the interpretation, and the understanding of his holy word. Amen. Thank you, Angela, once again. And thank you, all those of you who are tuned in this morning. And as you tune in later, I thank you for being with us and for the following and welcome you. If, uh, if you are a guest, um, 
please leave your name or, or message us and so we can know who you are and contact you and reach out to you as well. <clears throat> but uh, I do hope that you are enjoying our time of worship and being able to worship together in this way, in your own homes even, which is uh, new and different for many of us. But uh, I think it's one of the best things that may come out of it is that we can turn our homes into a place of worship and as well and do that on a daily basis. So um, today we're going to be starting a new series for the summer. <clears throat> and this summer I'm calling Lose Your Religion. And we're going to look at the Sermon on the Mount for the next several weeks and as we study Matthew chapter 5 through 7. And this, I think you're going to really enjoy this series and we're going to have a lot of fun with it and learn a lot. This is a really important series because the Sermon on the Mount represents the heart of Jesus' teaching. The things he said in Matthew 5 and through 7, he undoubtedly said many, many places on different occasions to many different people. He spoke to several audiences with this teaching. <clears throat> Excuse me. The overall theme of this message is that there is a difference between being religious and being spiritual. In the sermon, Jesus makes it clear that being religious is not enough. To live the life that you were created to live, you have to come alive spiritually because life is a spiritual event and God created you to be a spiritual being. Jesus begins the Sermon on the Mount by telling us that we can live a life of victory. We can live a life of significance. When many of us came to him, we were living a miserable, defeated life. But we don't have to stay that way. That is not God's will. We can live victorious, joyful lives, even in the midst of difficult circumstances. In fact, many Christians unfortunately miss out on the abundant life that God promises simply because they settle for less. When trouble comes their way, they say, oh, poor me, woe is me, instead of saying, how blessed I am, which we're going to see in a few minutes is really the right response for us to have. But by missing out on the abundant life, People miss out on the chance also to be part of changing the world. Changing the world. And we do that for the glory of God. No matter what your situation is, you can experience God's blessing in your life. You may be poor or rich, educated or not, married or single, young or old, no matter what your situation in life, today's message is for you. In Matthew 5, chapter 5, verses 1 through 16, there are some important truths about living. And here they are. Let's start with the first one. God promises you true happiness and then some. True happiness and then some. Jesus the Sermon on the Mount by saying in verse 3 to 5, blessed are the poor Now let's look at that word blessed. In the English language, it is the ultimate religious word, isn't it? You never hear that word at a non-religious event or in a non-religious context, do you? In fact, most people say this word, and when they say it, they don't even pronounce it the way it's supposed to be pronounced according to the rules of the English language. They don't say blessed they make it even more religious sounding by saying it in stained glass voices, blessed. <clears throat> we don't do that with any other word. We don't say, my hair is messed up today. I don't have enough time to get dressed today. But we do say, blessed. 
In English, it is a religious sounding word, very religious sounding word. But remember, Jesus did not speak English. And Matthew did not write his gospel in English. The word that is used in Matthew is not a religious term at all. It's a normal part of their everyday vocabulary. The word in the biblical Greek is makarios, makarios. There isn't a word in the English language that is equivalent to this word. In fact, blessed probably does come stated happy in many versions of the Bible. And happy is close to capturing the meaning. But makarios means so much more than happiness. There is also a sense in which this word implies, hey, congratulations, or way to go, or good for you. As if Jesus was saying, congratulations, poor in spirit. Way to go, you who mourn. Good for you, people who are meek. In the Greek language, makarios, makarios communicates the idea of contentment, fulfillment, satisfaction, completion. So when Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn, and so on, he was saying, here are the ingredients that result in absolute contentment, fulfillment, and happiness in life. He was saying, you can be happy in this life. You can be content. You can be fulfilled. He is telling you, you can be blessed. This is the kind of life he wants for you. As a follower of Jesus Christ, it's possible. It is possible to wake up every day and choose to say, wow, isn't life great? That's the kind of life he promises you contentment, and then some, fulfillment, and then some, happiness, and then some. It is a blessed life. So when we use the word blessed, keep in mind that it is a powerful word, powerful word that promises a life of God's goodness. The second thing I want you to notice is that True happiness comes in unexpected ways. <clears throat> Jesus' method of happiness is much different than what is taught in our popular culture. Our culture would teach these beatitudes or these principles in this way. Blessed are those who never mourn, for their life will be a bed of roses. Blessed are those who make up their own rules, for they answer to no one, but themselves. Blessed are the aggressive, for they'll get whatever they want. Blessed are those who show no mercy, for their enemies will fear them. Blessed are those who compromise their convictions, for they will never offend anyone. Blessed are those whose hearts are of stone, for they will never be hurt. Blessed are those who win the battle for their greatness and elevated to a status of celebrity, for they will be worshipped by men. That's our society's prescription for happiness. Jesus' method is completely the opposite. Let's take a look. These are called, this list is called the Beatitudes. Verse 3, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What does that poor in spirit mean? Jesus isn't talking about financial poverty here. Jesus did have much to say throughout his ministry about materialism, and he was very much against it. But that doesn't mean that he was for poverty. In fact, later in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus tells us that we are to help the poor financially. And the only way that you can do that is if you are not poor yourself. 
poor in spirit does not refer to your wallet. It refers to your heart. The word translated poor means absolute, abject poverty. The poverty of a beggar on the street. And just as a beggar is dependent on the generosity of others, we are dependent on God. Poor in spirit describes an attitude in which we approach God. It's not the attitude that says, oh, look at me, I'm better than most people, and God, you are so lucky to have me on your team. No, it's an attitude that says, God, without you, I am absolutely nothing. Jesus says that if this is your attitude, you are blessed, and the kingdom of heaven is yours. You get it. In verse 4, he says, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Jesus is saying, happy are the sad. It sounds like a contradiction, doesn't it? The kind of mourning, though, that Jesus is referring to is the kind of mourning that comes from being poor in spirit. It comes from those who recognize that they are completely helpless without God and that they have no good in themselves and cannot help but feel sorrow for their sinfulness. That kind of sorrow is good because it leads to repentance. Paul also taught this. He said, for godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret. Whereas worldly grief, worldly grief produces death. It's also a fact of life that surviving sadness gives us a greater appreciation for happiness. Overcoming a few defeats in life makes winning so much sweeter, doesn't it? Sorrow and mourning can be a blessed event in your life because when you surrender it to Jesus, it leads to joy. Verse 5, he said, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. You know, when I was in my early teens, I um, had a summer job on a horse ranch. And my, one of my jobs was cleaning out the stalls um, and the stables. And there was this one quarter horse that was huge, about 16 hands tall, and I was scared to death of him. This horse, turns out, was also a champion show horse. And he was bigger and far more powerful than you can imagine. And yet, what I thought was amazing was his trainer and rider was a 16-year-old girl who would gently tug on the reins and he would do whatever she guided him to do. He was a powerful animal, but his power was under control. Do you know what the Greek word for meek is? It's the describe a horse that has been trained by its master. Meekness doesn't mean weakness. It means power under control. Someone who is meek is strong enough to be gentle, strong enough to be tender, and yet strong enough to be forceful when necessary. But like the trained horse, that person does not do it on their own. They do it as they are guided by their leader. Moses, Joshua, David, Deborah. Personalities, but their strength was used because it was under control. You know, there are three kinds of people. There are victims, 
victimizers and the meek. The meek are too strong to become victims, or should I say, to remain victims. And they are too compassionate to become victimizers. Instead, they become heroes, defenders, protectors. They stand up for the weak and the oppressed. They are able to do it because they have surrendered their strength to the Lordship of Christ. And he uses it for his glory. Jesus said, blessed are the meek. It means blessed are those who don't let their power go to their head, but who instead surrender it to God to use as God sees fit. Those who do that, he said, will inherit the earth. Verse, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Jesus is saying, if you... If you crave... you would be filled. And here the Greek word for hunger refers to a hunger of a starving per person as they experience starvation. And the Greek word for filled is translated elsewhere as gorged. When it comes to righteousness, Jesus says, the more you want, the more you will get if you crave it. Verse 7 says, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Do you want to be more than happy? Wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't you like to be? You may be right and they may be wrong, but keep this in mind. When you show mercy to others, you heap mercy on yourself. Jesus and here again it's so important to understand the translation. This word in the Greek for pure means to cleanse, to purge, to purify. It was used to describe an army that had been cleansed of all the cowardly dis says blessed are the pure in heart he's not referring to those hearts that have always been pure that would eliminate all of us wouldn't it instead he's referring to those whose hearts have been cleansed not hearts that have always been pure but hearts that have been cleansed blessed are the pure in heart now listen your heart may have been filled with hatred and selfishness and greed at one time. It may even be that way now, but it can be cleansed. Happiness doesn't come from being a jaded, self-serving cynic. It comes from having a clean heart. When your heart is pure, you will see God. Verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. You know, in almost every church that I have served or attended, there have been a thrive on conflict. The common characteristic all of these people share is their visible lack of happiness. They aren't happy, and they will do all they can to make sure no one else is. Who have an amazing capacity for bringing people together. They know how to nip conflict in the bud, and they can make the worst enemies into the best of friends. The question is, 
which of these shoes fits you? If you are a peacemaker, if you dedicate your life to making things calm instead of stirring things up, you will be called what? A child of God. When you play the part of peacemaker, Jesus says you are being like God. And Jesus said there will be times also in the next verse when you are going to be mistreated simply for following him. And this puts you, he says, in good company because it happened to the prophets, the prophets of God in the Old Testament, and after Jesus' death and resurrection, it happened to the disciples and many leaders in the early church and Christianity. And it continues to happen to God's people throughout history and even today throughout the world. Christians are persecuted for his name's sake. To whatever extent a follower of Christ experiences persecution, he or she can take joy in the fact that their persecution puts them in an elite group who have done far more to change the world for the better than the persecutors have. Jesus is saying, if you want to be happier, more happy, stay faithful to him even when you're being mistreated. Which leads to the final, the third truth that we want to glean from today. And that is true happiness is contagious. Jesus concludes this section by saying in verse 13, you are the salt of the earth. In those days, salt was used for flavoring food as much as it was for preserving food. That's the role God's dedicated people have always played in society. Think about it. The hospitals that have been created, if all the hospitals, schools, food pantries, homeless shelters, orphanages that were founded in the name of Christ were suddenly just shut down, how devastating. The world would spin out of control. If all the people whose lives have been the world would be in complete chaos. When we live the way we were created to live, we, we become the world's preservative. Jesus also said in 14, you are the light of the world. Live the way that we were created to live. We lead people out of darkness and into light. For that reason, Jesus said in verse 16, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see the good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Now in the next chapter of Matthew, Jesus speaks against performing acts of piety in public in order to impress people. But that's not what he's talking about here. Here he's referring to the abundant life he promised us in the Beatitudes. He's offering you a life that will bring you more fulfillment than you could possibly imagine. He can make you truly happy. Don't hesitate to let the world know about it. Please, friends, don't hide your happiness. Don't hide your happiness. It's what you are created to be. Do you remember when we used to sing that song, This Little Light of Mine, I'm going to Let It Shine? That's what we need to do. We need to shine our light on the world around us, especially now when there is darkness everywhere. We do that by living out the Beatitudes. That's why they're so important. Your life can be happy, meaningful, fulfilling, and then some. God has promised to shower, shower you with blessings. As you consider this list that we've heard, this list of blesseds, 
you can see that happiness comes through surrendering yourself to God, to giving God control of your life and serving others with a heart of compassion. It sounds so simple and it really is. We complicate it. Happiness can come through surrendering yourself to God, giving God control of your life and serving others with a heart of compassion. So losing your religion means that you become more spiritual. This is how to become happy. And then some. It's a happiness we cannot hide from the world. May it be so. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you once again for 
following and being together in spirit. And I look forward to being with you next week again. And uh, please invite a friend and um, stick around today. There's a, spe a special, um, a special bonus song after the benediction. And I hope that we'll just join and sing that together. Um, I do, I'm aware that uh, Nancy Clark, I saw her this week, was in practice. If you have any birthdays or celebrations during the prayer time, you can put them in too because we like to celebrate those things together that we don't get to when we are not always together. So um, please feel free to do that. And now as we close out this service today, I pray that you will know the blessings of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, and the Father God to be with you as you go through your week uh, where you need healing. May God bring healing where you need peace. May he give you peace. If you feel unloved, may God comfort you and wrap his arms around you. And may you know that you are a child of God and a person of worth. Have a great week, folks. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. This little light of mine I'm gonna let it shine This little light of mine I'm gonna let it shine This little light of mine I'm gonna let it shine Let it shine Let it shine Let it shine Won't let Satan blow it out I'm gonna let it shine I won't let Satan blow it out I'm gonna let it shine I won't let Satan blow it out I'm gonna let it shine Let it shine Let it shine Let it shine Keep it shining till Jesus comes Jesus come oh.